at a specific problem rather than addressing a, la a large general issue. But it's one that does relate to some of the things that we've been hearing about already. In fact, um, partly it relates to the previous issue in terms of understanding landscape, or at least um, appreciating and valuing it by understanding it better. But actually, it's an archaeological problem, which I, I, I hope you'll, you'll enjoy a solution. Well, we think it's a solution to as archaeologists. So one of the things that we do in our research center here is that we do landscape survey in the Mediterranean. And uh, I'll show you a couple of slides in a moment. This is the, the structure for the talk. We'll, we'll be thinking about terraces primarily and dating terraces. And then I'll be talking about a novel methodology for uh, dating them and thinking about wider applications and I'll be perhaps I'll be asking you for help at the very end so you'll be aware of the long tradition of landscape survey in the Mediterranean where, which uh, in particular intensive ceramic or artifact survey where we walk across the surface of the land and we collect objects and then we plot them on distribution maps like these this is uh, from Bevan and Connolly's fantastic project on the island of Andy Kithera. And we make inferences about how the landscape was occupied in the past based on these. And we end up with maps that look a bit like this. This is from the Sydney Cypress survey. Now, uh, fantastically useful, interesting information. But as you can see, there are certain limitations. One of the main limitations, obviously, in this kind of diagram is that um, well, they've only been able to field walk relatively small proportion of this landscape along those those transects. And uh, the representation of occupation of the landscape that's presented is based on the occurrence distribution of finds and also of our understanding of those finds. So you can see there's an awful lot of dark green on there, which relates to late antiquity in this part of Cyprus, um, or at least our identification of ceramics, those ceramics as late antique ceramics. So, I mean, this is very valuable work, of course, it's extremely important, but there are large areas of the landscape there where we don't have any information because it's not being included in the field walking. Now, um, my friends and colleagues and I, uh, some of whom you will see on, I'm not going to acknowledge them on separately, but they'll pop up next to themselves with a little thing that says what their names are. And actually some of those people who've been with us in the field are here in the room. So uh, Gianluca, for example, who was wave Gianluca, say hi, <laughs> who was on Naxos with us last year doing doing field work. And uh, sitting next to him is Francesco, who will pop up right at the end. Wave oh no, Francesco's talking in a minute, so you don't need to wave. Um, we've been doing some field work um, here on the island of Naxos in Greece. Have you? Has anyone been to Naxos? Oh, only Katie. Right, and Mount Naxos is a sort of paradise for archaeologists. Um, so it's it's definitely worth going to, should you ever be there, especially if you're a medieval archaeologist. It's a particularly wonderful place. This is uh, the top of the mountain on which we are focusing our work. Here are some of my friends from Oslo. And they're focusing on the ruins within the, on the top of this mountain, which is a sort of mountaintop fortified town with all kinds of fantastic remains. So there they are. Meanwhile, Jim, who you see looking rascalish as usual on the left, is uh, working with our team from Newcastle and we're surveying the slopes and the countryside around this mountain, looking for all kinds of things like churches and houses, and as you see here also, terraces. And we're undertaking this traditional kind of ceramic, uh, intensive ceramic collection survey. So, you know, a couple of short seasons we've surveyed 50 odd hectares of this mountain, which I can tell you it was harder work than it sounds. It's quite a steep mountain. We carried 23,000 shards of pottery off that mountainside and it's 500 meters up to the top so it's quite exhausting. Um, here's some of the pottery but again of course what we're producing is, is a map with dots on maps. Uh, uh, dots on maps showing us where sites are, concentrations of finds are, rather than a more generalized um, uh, understanding of the historic landscape. Now, um, this is a 1943 air photo from the, air for the Royal Air Force uh, of part of Naxos and you can see immediately that that uh, landscape is covered with historic features. There's uh, stone, dry stone walls and lanes, there's uh, olive groves and trees and there are terraces, lots and lots of terraces. 
and um, with Jim some years ago we started our work on on Naxos by undertaking a, a project to see if we could get historic if historic landscape characterization would work as a methodology for understanding the wider landscape of the island rather than just relying on ceramics because they only as Katie Green discovered in her PhD thesis who's sitting here uh, she worked on uh, Turkey looking at these the similar methodologies uh, what she realizes is what different techniques will tell us about different periods of landscape development so we were trying to, to to see if we could say something about periods which are not not normally reflected in the uh, in the historical writing. Naxos doesn't really have anything in the way of pre-modern documentary sources, for example. So you can't write conventional landscape history in those terms. So I thought, fantastic! There's all these terraces. We must be able to use them to help us understand the development of this landscape. But it turns out that terraces are a bit of a problem for archaeologists and uh, landscape archaeologists in particular in that they have been extremely difficult to date so there are even some ancient historians who deny their existence in the ancient world at all because they're not mentioned in historical sources which seems highly unlikely that they didn't exist to me but nevertheless this is the case and even uh, scholars like Oliver Rackham were extremely cagey about suggesting that terraces existed in the Middle Ages. There was a, a study by a Swiss researcher uh, called Lehman on Naxos and he very tentatively suggested based on soil erosion rates that there might be some Byzantine terraces on Naxos. Um, but Rackham said it can't possibly be the case. He must have miscalculated because the evidence is, 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 is very difficult to manage. Despite the fact that you've got things like this 7th century basilica standing on a terrace which runs for one kilometer down the side of that that valley but you know i mean uh, there's all the usual questions of, of working out the stratigraphy between the the features it's quite tricky so there's very strong circumstantial evidence that these features do exist earlier but can we actually demonstrate it well um dating of terraces is a problem for archaeologists it's relatively unusual that we can use artifacts in the soil to get dates for terraces. Occasionally, as in this case study published in Antiquity in 2013, uh, there's so much ceramics in the soil that it's, it really looks like it's a reasonable argument that terraces are contemporary with these uh, deposition of this, these, these objects. But normally, as anyone who has dug a terrace will know, artifacts are pretty infrequent and the bits of objects that you get are very very small and often very heavily abraded they're fragmentary which means they are usually very hard to identify and date because even in the mediterranean where we have tons and tons of the stuff one very small reddish shard looks very much the same as the next one the soils are often redeposited and mixed by reworking and this is very difficult to detect just from a, a, a section through a terrace and of course excavation is expensive so excavation is not an answer to this problem um, even though some scholars have published studies where they they've they've made they've suggested that terraces for example these in uh, in Estremadura published by Maria Ruiz del Arbol she identified Roman ceramics in the, the, the base of this uh, terrace, but of course it doesn't tell you it's a Roman terrace. It could have been created at any time since the Roman period. So how about radiocarbon dating? Uh, this is a, st a study published by our keynote speaker from this morning, Felipe Criado Boado, uh, in Galicia. Uh, and some studies using radiocarbon dating have been undertaken, either on individual charcoal samples um, where of course we have various sort of risks problems like the old wood effect or on bulk samples so uh, Felipe's colleague Antonio Cortitas has published a, a nice study on bulk samples which he argued date from early medieval terraces but those bulk samples they tend to even out the dates that the soil is deposited they also tend to give you a much older date if you calibrate them against other techniques than, than, than a real date. They're expensive to produce uh, large numbers of samples. And the key point is that, imagine if you've got a terrace as high as this blackboard, if you get a radiocarbon date from here, you, all you know is the date of that bit of the, that bit of the uh, profile. You don't know the date of what's above it or what's below it. 
And these uh, types of features do tend to get mixed, redeposited, and so on. So there's another technique, um, OSL, optically stimulated luminescence, which uh, dates provides you a date for the time when the soil was buried. Uh, but this technique has been used on on so these are actually this is a, this is an archaeological site rather than a terrace system. It's been used on some terrace systems. The disadvantages of this are pretty much similar to the ones of radiocarbon dating in that if you put a, a date in here, you don't know what the date of the material above or below is. It's also relatively expensive, probably six or seven hundred pounds per sample. So you're looking at several thousand pounds for that uh, section just on the screen there. Um, so it doesn't provide a, a simple solution has been used on some uh, terraces, for example these ones in Jordan, but again we've got a few dates taken down this terrace system and um, it doesn't provide us with a reliable understanding of how those features have developed over time. So you're thinking about this problem in the context of a nice project in Catalonia, which with my colleague uh, Jordi Bolos, which was uh, undertaken originally with support from the Catalan Landscape Observatory, which is a marvellous institution, and they've just published their methodology for the, the Catalan landscape um, atlases. And in relation to the previous papers, actually, um, that work provides a fantastic uh, set of methodologies for uh, working with local stakeholders in uh, looking at landscape management. Anyway, one of the things they're interested in is historic landscape and historic landscape change. So they asked Jordi to undertake this project and we were involved in in, in sort of advising on a, on a, a kind of a characterization type uh, landscape analysis method to underpin and inform that work. And in the process of that, we became interested in terraces. I mean, look at these, fantastic place. Catalonia, unlike Naxos, has marvellous documentary records. So there's 9th and 10th century records for this place, Santa Julia de Cerdanyola, which is uh, in the um, foothills of the Pyrenees. We haven't done any dating on this, although we're, we're hoping to do some work on this site in due course. But we've still got this problem of how to get the dates. Well, Luckily, I, um, through a completely unmediterranean project on the southwest coast of England, where the, the rain was horizontal most of the time and you know it was cold and, and reasonably miserable, um, I was involved with this guy, who is clearly more adventurous than me, Tim Kinnaird, who's a geologist who worked at Suak. And we were discussing this problem of um, terrace dating, and he he suggested that we experimented with an instrument that they had recently invented and just started using to date archaeological profiles and archaeological sites. And this is the machine. It was actually, it was actually developed um, to test whether supermarket food had been irradiated or not by um, detecting residual luminescence in, in uh, quartz grains that are left on your salad leaves and other items. So it's, it's used widely in, in the uh, food industry. Uh, they produce them for about uh, 12, 15,000 pounds each. Uh, but the other thing that you can use this instrument for in the field is to um, test soil samples for their um, luminescence. And the great thing about this methodology is that instead of just taking one sample from one point in your profile, you can take a whole series of samples all the way down your profile, as you see in the illustration on the screen, and then just take one OSL date from somewhere in the sample and use that date to calibrate the rest of the profile. So instead of just getting one date and not knowing about what's above and below it, you can get a complete calibrated date for the whole profile. Well, that's the theory anyway. Did it work in practice? You, we ask ourselves. We, we thought it probably wouldn't because, you know, what actually works in practice when you think it's, when you think it's going to in theory. So we went to try it out in Catalonia with uh, Jordi on some of these terraces. And here we are, there's Tim testing the thing and there's Alex making a 3D kind of uh, record of the, of the intervention. And we tried it on a number of different sites in Catalonia. And uh, that's Alex's scan. And this is one of them, this is a place called Vilalta, which is a little village you can see uh, just here. It's got a nice 
uh, 12th century church and a 12th century documentary reference and you can see the fields all around it which I looking at it swore blind must be post-medieval in date you know maybe 18th or, or 19th century so we went and we sampled one uh, site from here this place here, and you can see those beautiful terrace walls there's tens of thousands of kilometers of terrace walls built with this kind of rough ashlar um, faces in this area of Catalonia and uh, lo and behold against all expectations the technique did work effectively and gave us a date of construction for this terrace of around about 1200 AD. And this is quite significant because nobody's been able to date these terraces before using scientific uh, method or any other method. So the next step for us was to link these to our landscape characterization uh, and obviously the, i mean you know after this we can what we need to do is a more detailed study of a whole terrace system but here we can, might say well if that terrace at number one dates to about 1200 then potentially the other terraces with the same morphology in that area may also be of a similar date so we may be able to then begin to understand the um, patterns of evolution in this historic landscape in much more detail here's another example this is a place called El Espanol which is uh, in a different kind of you can see it's got a different type of arrangement of terraces the landscape looks a bit different here we took a couple of samples from uh, these uh, these locations but once again the methodology was effective in um, producing dates in this case uh, dating the construction of that terrace to the middle to late 15th century uh, and again that Espanol so we we might then suspect that those other terraces which share that morphology might also be from the later Middle Ages and we think that this uh, methodology has considerable scope for addressing a wide range of questions, not only the, when terraces were first built, but also because we get uh, a whole uh, profile of the terrace system, looking at um, the long-term development, because we can link those soil samples to their stratigraphy, we can, we can potentially also test other types of you know um, other types of scientific uh, analyses on them looking at pollen or macrofossils or soil geochemistry maybe dna a whole range of different analyses and actually write the landscape history directly from the soil rather than uh, relying on patchy documentary sources but this also gives us the the scope perhaps to understand long-term landscape change which means that we might be able to think about sustainable landscape management thinking in terms of well okay we know the landscape we know that the the soil was deposited very quickly over this period of time um, what were the other factors combining that with archaeological evidence for demography for example or climate change we might be able to produce a much more nuanced record of um, the developing landscape history there's Francesco in uh, Silesia in Turkey looking equally almost as roguish as Jim was earlier in fact um, and there is Gunde Varignolu who's the director of that project's foot I haven't got the whole of Gunde in a picture only her only her foot um, so we tested a whole series of terrace systems in both uh, Naxos and in Greece uh, and in Turkey uh, last year and uh, this is one of those terrace systems you can see a whole system of terraced valleys extending all the way down through this catchment um, this is a deserted lovely deserted settlement which we discovered the year before we returned last year to find it had a road bulldozed right through the middle of it and a whole load of uh, buildings kind of flattened but uh, anyway that's that's life um, so here's one of these things you can see the state of some of these kind of terraces they're still in use still in use for arable agriculture but also still um, grazed and so preliminary indications are that methodology also works in our Turkish and uh, Greek case studies but unfortunately I can't present to you the final results so um, we think this has got great scope it's got scope not only in the Mediterranean of course but also potentially for looking at earthwork features in, in other parts of the world for example in Britain and one of the key mysteries for example in the southwest of Britain is the date of hedge banks which nobody really knows when hedge banks were built so I'm I'm asking for a little bit of help uh, potentially if anyone knows of any upcoming projects which are going to cut through a whole load of earthworks for example a whole load of hedge banks or uh, a few tens of kilometers of ridge and furrow 
in about 12 months time. If you do know of such a project, please let me know because we can put in a, a research grant proposal to one of the funders and we could finally address some of these mysteries like the cycles of use, data, of, of origin and use of origin furrow and the enclosure of the landscapes of southwest England. So I told you it was a small um, mystery. If you're interested in the paper, uh, that's, a, that's a guest pipeline I'm going across the bottom of my mum's farm in Devon. Um, if you're interested in the paper, it's published in Journal of Archaeological Science. Uh, meanwhile, thank you for your attention and please do tell me if you know of any good projects.